Hi, um, my name is Miriam Scher. And I'm Dori Guthrie. And we're going to have a conversation today about art and education. Absolutely. Our background, mm -hmm. how we came to where we are today. So why don't you start, Dori? Where did you go to school? How did you get involved in your medium, which is glass? Mm -hmm. So I originally started when I was 17. My father was a graphic designer and he always encouraged the art. So he said, oh, I think, you know, this is kind of different. And it's kind of rare to actually have a glass studio in your hometown. So I, I feel very fortunate for that. And I knew that I always wanted to do something in art and education. And so I ended up going to Illinois State for art education. And then I did about a year of that and then realized within the teaching, within the arts, that if I just fully focused on glass, then I would be able to teach it in the long run for more like high school, college. So um, I did switch my major, which my parents didn't quite understand. Like, I don't, I don't get how you're, you're trying to do art ed, but you're quitting art ed. But that was kind of the, the path I ended up taking just to fully dive into glass because it's such a difficult medium to work with. So yeah. that's it. And here I am, you know, 20 some years later. So <laughs> and, and for you? Well, um, I am a little bit older and my parents were depression children. Mm -hmm. So when I wanted to be an artist, they were like, how are you going to afford to pay your bills? I didn't bring up any bums. You have to pay your own way. And my aunts, especially my mom, who was a nurse, mm -hmm. and my father's a doctor, so they're very grounded. Um, and my sort of unspoken deal with them, as long as I was a self-supporting adult, mm -hmm. they would be okay with it. It mm -hmm. took them a long time. I had a variety of paths that I took over the years. I started in Fiverr, where I went to Philadelphia College of Art, where I have a BFA. And then I moved to New York. I didn't know anyone, had no marketable skills, really. And I met my then boyfriend, who's now my husband. I was doing all these collages. And he was like, well, you could do mechanicals. And I'm like, what are mechanicals? And they were graphic design. And gra it doesn't exist anymore. It's a medium. It, you know, it was the waitressing of graphic design. And when I went to university, PCA at the time, it was very Swiss graphics. Everything, I mean, they would spend a whole semester drawing a lowercase Helvetica E, and I was like, mm -hmm. oh, I can't do that. He's like, of <laughs> course you can do that. And, you know, I took, I talked my way into a couple jobs, which you could do then. Mm -hmm. And then I got more jobs doing mechanicals and occasionally an illustration. and. I took classes at School of Visual Arts and put together an illustration portfolio. The same time I was taking classes at the Center for Book Arts, okay. where I learned bookbinding because I took a book class in my last semester. Someone who really didn't know what he was doing, but it spoke to me. It really spoke to me. And then I've studied privately with people, and that's probably what I'm best known for. But I come to the book from fiber, which is okay. a little unusual. But people come to books from all, there's a lot of people making glass books and they're yep. really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, people come to books from every single discipline. Well, I think it's nice because when you are an artist, you have a language. So if it's fiber, if it's book baking, you know, that language shows through, which I think is nice. And having a different approach too, because I work with a lot of different artists that are non-glass people and I know what the material can do and it's more free. And sometimes I wish I could start all over and just kind of, you know, break those boundaries in a way because I, I know, you know, what it can and can't do in some ways. So, um, did I you ever have that. a mentor? Um, I would say my father was probably the That's biggest one for sure. And then, um, when I went to Illinois state, there were, um, a married couple that were both glass artists that kind of took me under their wing and showed me, you know, what things to apply for and, and where to go. That's through. amazing. Yeah. It was really amazing. And you were talking about, you know, your parents, being a little about iffy, you know, saying that, you know, you're, you're going into the arts. You know, my, we didn't come from any money. Um, my mom actually was hired out of John Deere when she was 19. So luckily at that time, you know, the, the insurance was good and they were matching 401ks, you know, so she actually got lucky. And my father was able to kind of create his graphic design, which was commercial arts back right. in the day. Everything was hand, you know, written right. and spray glue on the, I remember all that. And, you know, he said, if you are passionate about something, then it will show through and, you know, people will want to work with you because you're happy. You want to be passionate about it. You, you work really hard for, for what you want and people will see that and the money will come some way. 
So I feel very fortunate that, you know, he taught me that at a young age of just, you know, keep, keep setting goals for yourself. If this is what you want, people will, will want to work with you and, and create that community, which I feel very fortunate about. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really didn't have that. I actually, Did you have a community? Because you were talking I've about I've built a community okay. since I've been here and in the book arts, in the not-for-profit art center world mm -hmm. of New York. Um, I graduated, I went to art school in the 70s. Mm -hmm. So things were really different. Now, from what I understand, speaking to a lot of younger women artists, that a lot hasn't really changed. It's just a lot more veiled. So when I went to art school, things were very... Um, blatant in the misogynistic yeah. approach to things and people telling you your work sucks straight to your face. <laughs> and when I actually applied, asked my undergraduate department head for a recommendation for graduate school, he said no. And that was devastating. And I went from one place to another um, and I sort of built this quirky kind of career, but I never really had a mentor. And I like to, I never wanted to teach. Mm -hmm. I, because of my experience, and I would say from second grade, when the teacher said to my mother, Mimi wants to answer all the questions and she won't <laughs> shut up because I was a, a talk a lot, you know? <laughs> what can I say? Um, and to this person turning me down to, I mean, one thing after another, and I don't know what pushed me forward. I just knew I had to do what I needed to do. And I... I've always said the teaching chose me. Okay. I, I really was like, I tried to avoid it. And then a friend of mine, who's a graphic designer, Ed Hutchins, said, you need to teach, you're already doing it. Because I do believe in sharing information. Mm -hmm. I always would say, nobody learned mm -hmm. this in the room. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it. Any of those people who try to like guard their information, I, that's like immoral I and obscene. Very much agree. <laughs> and he was like, you need to teach. I was like, no, no, no. And then he got me a little artist in schools gig in Westchester. Okay. And then I called him, I'm like, well, now what? And he said, you'll come see me. So I had a car at the time I drove up there. He made lunch, we had lunch, we cleared the dishes, and then we just sat around the table making little books and mm -hmm. talking. And truthfully, the rest is history. I have been really lucky to be able to get various teaching jobs over the years. And I was saying to you earlier, I've done everything from pre-K to post-grad adult workshops. Um, I've taught in universities. So what made you want to get your master's then? Was it for the teaching degree it was or you wanted to further yourself? It or was what? purely pragmatic. I okay. was teaching in an MFA. Okay. program. I did not have an MFA. Okay. It was starting to become an issue. And now... And this it, was in Philly? No. Okay. Oh, no. This no. is... <laughs> Somewhere else. Okay. <laughs> I, I got my MFA in 2014. Okay. For all those was, years... I was going to say how much time in between. 1978 okay. to 2014. Good <laughs> <laughs> And I did it for purely practical reasons because... I didn't have an MFA. I was teaching in an MFA program. It was mm -hmm. becoming an issue. Mm -hmm. I did a low residency program through trans art, mm -hmm. um, which is not trans border art, just yeah. so we're clear. <laughs> and it was a fantastic low residency. It was a okay. great fit for me. Um, and I sort of think if you're going to take, get an MFA, mm -hmm. you should do it to push your work forward, not because you think you're going to get a full-time teaching job yeah, at yeah. a university because mm -hmm. that ain't happening. Yeah. I mean, especially even now more with COVID, who mm -hmm. even knows what some of the programs yeah. are going. And what happened is um, I got sick. Mm -hmm. um, I had to leave my job. I was a lecturer, a senior lecturer at Columbia College Chicago in their art and art history department. I came on in the interdisciplinary MFA in book, paper, and print. But then um, they were going to close the program. Okay. And it was, I was commuting from Brooklyn mm -hmm. and I knew it was like, it was the most, it was almost like fantasy land academia in the beginning. And then of course it changed, but I, it was, it didn't make sense for me to really move forward. And then I got sick, so mm -hmm. it wasn't possible to keep up the commute. Mm -hmm. And the great irony is I got the MFA for pragmatic reasons. It turned out to be one of the best things I ever did for myself. And I'd always designed my teaching in opposition to my personal experience in the educational system. Mm -hmm. 
until I did my MFA with TransArt. And the women who were my mentors, Laura Gonzalez, uh, Radha Subramian, and uh, Lynn Book, were fantastic. And they made me, that was the thing that was also so interesting, is that only did it affect my practice, it affected my approach to teaching. So you feel that you wouldn't be where you are today if it wasn't for your MFA. Things would look differently. Maybe. Yeah. I'm not sure. I mean, I might have gotten there. I knew who I was as an artist. And the thing that was so wonderful about this program is a lot of MFA programs, from what I understand, want to take you apart and remake you kind of a militaristic mm -hmm. approach to education. And mm -hmm. I am not interested in that. Mm -hmm. Like, I can do that to myself. Yeah. By myself, yeah. just fine. Yeah. I don't need anyone. Yeah. And my undergraduate degree was so experience was so abusive. I was like very not wanting to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. um, so TransArt was a great fit for me because they will give you suggestions and try to open up your thinking, mm -hmm. but they're not going to try and destroy you emotionally, mm -hmm. spiritually, psychologically. And that is really the difference. I think you have to find the right place for right, you. Right, yeah. And you knew you were ready. I, I really That's didn't. That's important. I knew. I don't have my MFA. Right. Mm -hmm. And I've been teaching for 14 years. Right. And my trajectory is a little bit different because, um, I mean, glass is a really difficult medium. It's been around for a long time and there's so many different ways to use it. And I feel very fortunate that I started at a young age. And now I'm in New York and helping, you know, others fabricate their work. And so I feel like, yeah, I, I always think about, I, I should have my MFA because it opens up more doors. I know that adjunct positions are no. less and less and tenure is, you know, pretty much non-existent. Right. But I do feel that it, it does open up. It's your union card. When mm -hmm. I got it, my husband said to me, oh, well, it looks like you're going to get your union card. You know, it gives you some kind of credential. I had friends who were a little annoyed at me because I had taught everywhere mm -hmm. and I had been showing and mm -hmm. I'd been working internationally mm -hmm. and I never had an MFA. Mm -hmm. But it actually turned out to be a very positive thing for me. And I think it was because of the program. Yeah. You have to find the right, like in any relationship, you mm -hmm. have to find the right fit. Yeah. yeah. Well, even just balancing work and school too, because income has to come in, <laughs> you know, and you said you were married. I'm also married. So being, you know, a wife and a teacher and, you know, all these different yeah. hats, it's, yeah, yeah. No, it has it, to be able to There's a lot of complications. Yeah with life. And at the time, I was also commuting to Chicago to teach full time. Wow. It was very positive. And the thing that was interesting, too, is that um, they do their coursework in Berlin. Mm -hmm. You work on your own. Mm -hmm. You meet with your mentor by video, mm -hmm. by uh, Skype. Uh, you set those times up. And then everyone gets together and is in Berlin for the summer. And well, three weeks in the summer, and they take their classes. And do you feel that teaching enriches your work a little bit? Oh, the great secret of teaching is you learn so, so much, much from yeah. your students. And especially with the little ones, if they if you try to yeah. show them something <laughs> yeah. and they're like, I don't get it. You have to know that it's not them, it's yeah. you. And it has made me be clearer mm -hmm. about so much. But yeah, the big secret is you learn as much, if not more, from your students. Yes. They open up your thinking. Mm -hmm. And that's really an incredible mm -hmm. uh, gift. I agree. Hi, I'm Kat Riles. Um, I am an artist, photographer, and also the co-founder of the arts platform Paradise Palace. Um, my relationship to arts education is that I have experience teaching um, as a TA at the college level. I've also um, taught in museums and nonprofits um, as a teaching artist as well. Um, for me, that was more of um, sort of an introductory uh, to teaching, I more see myself currently in the role of a mentor more than an educator. Hi, my name is Natalie Bravo Barbie, and I'm a visual artist. I work with photography and installation art. Art education for me was something that was really important starting at a young age. I began photographing when I was 15 years old, and I knew that I wanted to learn everything I could about it. 
And so a lot of the processes that I've learned has been through going to workshops or attending school. And I really love learning. And I think that it's such an important part of an artist, whether it's formal education or informal learning from your peers. It's just such an incredible thing to be able to see how things are made, learn how they're made and the backstory of them. And so in my work, I like to use, I'm a process oriented photographer, so I like to keep my hands busy and, and really get my hands dirty with my work. And I, I never stop learning. So I'm constantly taking workshops and looking for other ways to incorporate new ideas into my work. Yeah, I also was going to say that I love learning too. And that's something I'm my work is also installation, photography, a mix of technical skills. I'm always learning new skills, um, you know, like whether it's introductory to molding and casting as something I'm interested in for a project, um, or it's something that's research-based. Um, a lot of my work is conceptual, so I'll take courses like um, from Morbid Anatomy on ruins, for instance. and. So I find myself, even though I've left higher education, still constantly looking for places to continue to learn and grow. That's such a great point. It, I went to grad school and in grad school, I realized that I knew nothing and that I needed to learn a lot more. So even after I graduated um, with my master's, I continued taking writing classes yeah. to write about my artwork better. Yep. It's such an important thing to do to write about the work. Yeah. It's really painstaking, but it's, it's such a big part of it. And workshops, I'm constantly taking workshops. I love learning um, how things function. Yeah. And with photography, there's so many different things you yeah. can learn. It's just never ending. Yeah, and that's sort of, um, you know, part of why I started Paradise Palace was you know, you don't get, well, there's a lot of great classes that I took in undergrad and grad school. Like, um, specifically in undergrad, I felt like a lot of my courses were really good because I'd be introduced to a lot of new subjects. But in grad school, I felt like um, all of my needs weren't necessarily being met. And I was starting to look outside of school to make, get those needs met. And it was a lot cheaper and more direct, uh, less time consuming. Um, so I just, I think that there's a, a lot of gaps that still need to be filled in higher education and um, some of those things you know you still need to continue learning even after you leave anyway which is like doing professional development workshops learning how to write about your work and sometimes they're just really important just to have them as refresher courses like i've been wanting to take a lighting studio lighting class even though i know how to photograph in the studio but i'm just like maybe i should take a refresher course and just like re-familiarize myself you know it's been a while. That's really such a great point. I think refreshers are so important because even though you might have learned something 20 years ago, yes. there's updated technology yes. and you have to stay on top of that yep. as an artist, well, especially photography, camera equipment is changing, printing equipment changes constantly. Yep. So you have to learn how to use that also software. Yep. Adobe Photoshop likes to change things up for you and you constantly have to learn new tools and I definitely think um, education is such an important thing, but not everyone can afford it. Yeah. And not everyone is in, in that place. And for me, when I graduated with my undergrad, I was I knew I wanted to go to grad school. Yeah. But financially, it wasn't in the cards because fine, um, grad school at the time, they said I had to do full time and I yeah. couldn't work. And it's like, yeah. how do you live in New York and go to grad school yeah. without and, and pay rent? Mm -hmm. And so it was something that I had to delay for a long time until I yeah. can make it work. But the thing they don't tell you is that there's grants available yeah. that um, you can definitely get a lot of assistance in that. But they, up front, it's a very scary thing. Right. And I mean, I think the real big issue we're having with our higher education right now is that we never really ask ourselves why we're doing it. It's mm -hmm. just like, oh, I'm supposed to go to college. Like I'm supposed to go to school. That's just what you do. I get my degree, that's that. Um, but for me, like there was a lot of whys that I was answering by going to grad school. Um, I, well, in just school, you know, college in general, there was, um, I wanted to learn comprehensive technical skills, like not just one or two classes about photography, but like all of it. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew I was interested in making conceptual work, so I wanted to be introduced um, to criticism and theory. And I also am a project-based artist, so it was really helpful to like learn discipline and time management and project management by going to school. So it really served me after I left. 
However, if you're an artist that's not, doesn't really need any of those things to build a career, you should ask yourself if college is the right path for you. Are there these uh, additional resources or alternative educations that are much more affordable or, and much less time consuming that you can do? And then I also think it's important to, as we were talking about, continue this education through um, refreshers and finding peer networks and support groups that um, will always provide you with support and resources as you grow professionally. I, I love the idea of the peer networks. It's just something that ha I learned after I graduated grad school. Uh, I had been living in the same neighborhood for oh, almost 30 years at the time, and I didn't feel like I had a community in mm -hmm. that neighborhood in Queens, but I moved further out. And the moment I moved further out, I actually found the community. And uh, I'm, I'm part of uh, CEQA, it's the Southeast Queens Artists Alliance. And mm -hmm. we do peer reviews, we show each other work, we have this close-knit community of artists that can talk about it, that we're helping each other with opportunities all mm -hmm. the time. And it's so important. And a lot of us are educators. Yeah. And so then we look at ourselves and what we have and how we can give that to the community. Yeah. So then we apply for grants and we we give back to our community within the form that we know in education, holding mm -hmm. free workshops in the park and sidewalks and doing things that we can kind of entice that idea of you can learn more, but mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be in an academic setting. Right. And I mean, that's, so that's part of like why I started Paradise Palace was thinking about this like gap between education and your career, because a lot of times in school, they're not teaching you business classes. They're not teaching you these professional development. They're teaching you how to walk the walk and talk the talk, but they're not teaching you how to pay your rent whenever you leave. Um, and then we're left to kind of figure that out for ourselves. So that's why these support groups and peer networks become so important because we all end up building our careers together and resource sharing. Um, so it becomes taking a village. I do remember when I went to undergrad, one of the ways that they get you in is that we'll, we'll help you find the job. Oh, I know. Yeah, that's such bullshit. And it never <laughs> happens. Once yes. you graduate, <laughs> you're on your you're own. You're out. They're, yeah. They kick you to the curb. Like, yeah. Why are you asking me questions? Yeah. yeah. And they give you the tools, but then they leave you outside and yeah. don't tell you what to do with the tools. And so it is really important to have a community to tell you how, what do I do next? or going to like workshops and then meeting other people and yeah. networking and networking. And that yes. was the one thing, like I went to SCAD for undergrad and their whole thing that they just like beat into our uh, brains was uh, networking, network, network, network. And we were just like, ugh, yeah. <laughs> you know? And now here I am um, 10 years out of uh, undergrad and I'm like, oh yeah, that is really the key to building your career. And Again, you know, I kind of felt lost whenever I got out of school both times. Like it just didn't feel like what I was given, my degree, the, the tools I was given were not serving me in finding um, paid work for my creative, um, you know, skill set. And that, that was where we really came in with Paradise Palace is we were like thinking uh, about emerging artists and early career artists. That's where we had our head is. How do we help early career artists make sales from their creative work? Like maybe it's not thousands and thousands of dollars of work, but start to really get in that mindset of like, oh yeah, I can make a whole career out of just my creative work. And I don't have to always just be doing these other outside things that maybe you don't love doing yeah. um, in order to make a career. Um, so yeah, that's where we were. We were at there like looking at how to um, build collectorship, looking at, you know, outside of high income, collectors, how do we get people um, in a broad spectrum of incomes to collect art um, and also build community, you know, peer support like we were talking about. I love that idea because it feels like a lot of people from low income communities, they think art is inaccessible. It's mm -hmm. expensive. I can't yeah. collect it. It's, you know, but educating and saying you can afford it. You know, there are a lot of artists that need to learn, you know, need to learn how to make money off of it. And it, it doesn't need to be a lot of money. No. That's really the misunderstanding of the community is that artists need to make a lot of money. Right. We just need to survive. Well, that's, I think it's that we need to be more f focused on um, our, our goals from the start with education need to be like, how do I sustain myself independently without somebody else? I mean, there's 60,000 plus artists in the city alone and like maybe a couple hundred galleries. Like that right there. <laughs> it's not, yeah. those galleries are not going to serve everyone, but there's so many opportunities 
um, creatively to serve your practice outside of like, I was told in school, I'm supposed to just sit in my studio and paint and that's it. Like you can make t-shirts and sell them in addition to t-shirts. You can sell your own work on Instagram. You can create a Patreon and have people support your work that way. Like there's an infinite number, number of ways to build yourself as a business, as an artist, and still be really happy and proud of everything that you're doing. Yeah. I, I know that when I graduated, I thought this idea of I'm going to go into academia and I want I won't yeah, want to teach. I did too. <laughs> but the, the whole thing is nobody tells you it's impossible to really find a job. good job teaching. Yep. You're an adjunct. You can maybe find one position to fill a year. Yeah. And that's not a lot. And they'll give you peanuts for yeah, it. Yeah, and they'll give you peanuts for it. You're working really crazy hours. It's, yeah. it's really a lot of things that... Uh, it's not talked about in the community, yeah. but needs to be talked about. Yeah. And that's why I, when I learned that there's like places like Penumbra and ICP, mm -hmm. that you can take individual classes and you don't have to pay yep. for an entire degree. You can just, yep. if you want black and white photography, you can learn black and white photography. Yep. If you want to learn how to cyanotype, you learn cyanotype. You don't have to pay twenty and more $30,000 for a degree to learn just the one thing that you're interested in. Yeah. And I love, I love that idea of alternative education. Yeah. I mean, and the way that school is set up now, you know, you're supposed to just mysteriously make money, like, <laughs> you know, and it's weird because we are in a capitalist society, whether we like it or not, but they don't, when you're going through formal education as an artist, they're not treating you like you're going to be part of that mm -hmm. um, system. You're mm -hmm. just a magician that just makes, you know, curators appear in your studio and you paint something and sell it for thousands of dollars. And it's just, there's, there's a lot of opportunities that we're just not taking advantage of creatively. And that's where I'd like to see education go is to like expand our horizons. Absolutely. They don't teach you about accounting taxes, how nope. to pay your taxes, your work nope. in 1099s. How do you handle those things? It's a lot of question, unanswered questions in academia, but you need to know these answers and exactly. they give you tools, but then there's other ones that are much more necessary that they yep. don't give you. And the most important one is how do I make a living from what I just learned? Yeah. Exactly. How do I use this in exactly. the real world? Yeah. And you know, like I was fortunate enough to take business classes when I both was in undergrad and in grad school, but they were not required whatsoever. So that to me was a big red flag of why are these not being, um, required within your 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 final education you know like how are you just sending people out into the world just expecting them to know what to do next yeah i think uh academia has a lot to uh a lot of answers that they need to start giving their students um and i think conversations like this are so important yeah exactly i mean like you were saying earlier i just we never stop learning um so i think it's important to just always think about how what ways you like to learn and what ways benefit you the most, whether that is just joining a social circle to bounce ideas off of or take a workshop or a class or enroll in formal education. Like what is that goal and outcome for you and is it worth it?